I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. One of the most difficult aspects in starting to study Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah is getting a handle on just how those ideas developed over time. It's tempting to think that, for instance, Kabbalah has just always existed in the form that we have it, or that Kabbalah is just one thing at all. Of course, neither of these positions is really tenable. Such notions developed greatly through the ages and are still developing, and there are now and there have always been numerous mutually exclusive schools of Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah. This class is meant to serve as an introduction to Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah from the point of view of its incredibly complex development from the prophets of ancient Israel unto the rise of modern Hasidism in the 18th century. Of course, this series isn't meant to be exhaustive by any means, but only should serve as a springboard for deeper study and reflection, and hopefully it will also enable you to accentuate developments in Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah in their historical and cultural context, and hopefully embolden you to dive into the primary texts, which are admittedly as sublime as they are obscure. Let me express my gratitude to Congregation Tchia for allowing me to use these lectures to reach a larger audience here on Esoterica. If you want, you can find the entire series under the playlist Entering the Garden, an Introduction to Jewish Mysticism and Kabbalah. I'll be uploading them over the next few weeks, or if you find these episodes after autumn of 2021 and you want to watch the entire series, you can find them in that playlist. If you find this series on Kabbalah interesting, I'd hope you check out my other content on topics in esotericism and perhaps consider supporting the production of free academic and scholarly topics in occultism, hermetic philosophy, by joining my Patreon or perhaps with a one-time donation. You can find those links below, and I really appreciate your consideration. Now, let's enter the garden of Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah. So as we talked about last time, the Sefer, the Sefer Zohar is a, is a kind of mystical midrash uh, composed of a bunch of uneven sections that has become the core of the Kabbalah. In fact, it is now the core of the Kabbalah. It's the most recently added scripture of Judaism after the Talmud. The Talmud uh, in the midrash literature is a kind of scripture, and the Zohar has now become a kind of scripture as well, depending on the community, especially in the Orthodox world, less so in the liberal world. Um, it's composed uh, by Moshe de Leon in the circle around him sometime in the late 13th century, although it's traditionally ascribed to Shimon bar Yochai, who's a second century sage. And some of the core concepts we talked about last time are Shechina. This is the idea that God has a feminine aspect. And that Shechina, that feminine aspect of God, dwells in our world. That is how we experience God, is through God's uh, feminine aspect. And part of what's going on in the in the Kabbalistic uh, drama and the in the Kabbalistic theory is that the goal in some level of Kabbalah is a kind of sacred marriage between Israel, the Shekhinah, and the Shekhinah, the Shekhinah in Israel and the upper Sephirot. And we'll talk about how that's accomplished in just a second. And as you may remember last time too, when we talked about the concept of evil in the Zohar. Unlike previous, more philosophical uh, theories of evil, in which evil was simply a privation, you can think of uh, cold being the absence of hot, or darkness being the absence of light, the Zohar rejects that theory and says, no, evil is very real. It's actually part of the, the dross. The, it's an afterbirth uh, in terms of how reality is created. And that afterbirth comes, or that dross is thrown off with by Gevura, God's judgment or uh, God's uh, uh, justice. It's Gevura overcome, it's Guvara when Guvara is overcome uh, in such a way that Chesed doesn't check it. And when Chesed or mercy and love doesn't check Gevura, that overflow of judgment becomes evil. And that forms a different dimension of reality called Sitra Achra, the other side. And that other side is where uh, the opposite of God lives. This is the realm of the demonic. 
And the Zohar is very, very, very concerned about the realm of the demonic. And it has, in fact, a very complex, uh, a couple of different complex, very com uh, demonological systems. Unfortunately, we don't have time to get into all those demonological systems, but um, we, we could we could in another, maybe if we do a whole Zohar class, we could get into the, the Zoharic uh, demonology. Um, as I mentioned also, right, the Zohar is hyper literal. It likes to take things very, very seriously. Remember I said that one of the things that the Zohar likes to um, uh, read into the Bible is anywhere the direct object marker, et, occurs in Hebrew. And I think someone uh, pointed out in the chat last time that the word et occurs everywhere in the Hebrew Bible. Of course it does. Everywhere there is a direct object in a sentence, the word et appears in Hebrew. And, and so people said, yeah, the, the Shekhinah must be everywhere. And that's what et means according to the Zohar. Anytime there's an et, that means the Shekhinah is there. And people said, well, that means the Shekhinah is everywhere. And of course, Shekhinah is everywhere because God is everywhere. And God only appears as Shekhinah in our realm, according to the Sefer Zohar. Now, how do we, how do we deal with this hyperliteralism? And well, we deal with it with a kind of hyper-conservatism when it comes to Jewish law. And that takes the form that the Zohar is very, very literal about the doing of Jewish law. It does not interpret the Jewish law metaphorically. It says that if the Torah tells you to put the felon on every day, you do it. And not only do you do it, that is the key to seducing Shekhinah. And I didn't talk about this much last time, and I should have, but it was a mistake of mine, that the, the Zohar likes to describe the commandments, the following of the commandments as something like foreplay are seducing God. And as we seduce God by following the commandments, we become married to God through Irusim. We become married to God through like kind of a marriage. And that marriage to God is exactly what's supposed to happen to redeem the world. That is to say, the, male, the masculine, the feminine, all these things are, are, are balanced. And that balance is the metaphysical ideal that the Zohar aims for. And so the following of the law is not just a optional thing in the Zohar. The following of the Jewish law, the scrupulously following of the Jewish law, Shabbat, laying to fill in, keeping Shabbat, um, separating meat and milk, all the things, all the 613 rules that you, that you know and love, those are not just rules to follow. They are the roadmap by which one seduces, Israel seduces God into the sacred marriage. And in that sacred marriage, the cosmos is repaired. And that reparation of the cosmos is the goal of the uh, Kabbalah as it's understood by the Zohar. And so there is no Kabbalah. There's no Kabbalah for the writer of the Zohar without scrupulous, scrupulous halakhic attention, attention to the Jewish law. And that's one thing, really one point I want to drive home. Now, I'm not trying to say that Jewish, that non-Jewish people can't appreciate Kabbalah, that non-Jewish people can't learn from Kabbalah. I'm saying that the writer of the Zohar does not imagine that there is a Kabbalah, not just outside of Judaism. That's not even imaginable. There's no Kabbalah outside of a strict Orthodox Judaism. And so the, the idea of Tikkun Ulam is, you know, hel helping the world and repairing the world by giving charity and doing activism. The writer of the Zohar would say, sure, but you got to do the other stuff too. It's not enough to give to charity and help make the world better materially you have to very carefully keep the law you have to make sure that you don't wear clothes that have linen and wool blended together shatnets because that destroys the universe that destroys the cosmos when you do that you have to make sure they're separate and by observing that you help to balance the world so it's a very legalistic mysticism. And I know that the phrase legalistic mysticism sounds bizarre to us because we think of mysticism as kind of pervasiveness. It's just feeling and emotion. It's just experience. But that's not true for Kabbalah. It's about obedience and transcendence. It's about imminence and transcendence. And we have to do balance both according to the, to the Zohar. So now, again, I'm not trying to gatekeep here and say that non-Jewish people can't appreciate Kabbalah. I'm just saying this is what the Zohar says. Does that mean you have to accept what the Zohar says? No, you can do what the hell you want. That's your business. I'm just telling you, don't let anyone tell you that it's Kumbaya in the Zohar, because that's just not true. Now, does that mean that you have to be bound to that? No, but I don't want to lie to you. I'm going to sell you some hippy dippy Kumbaya Zohar. I'm just going to be honest about what it says. 
Now, what it says and what to do with it are two different questions. And what to do with it is a question you have to deal with. That's, that's your business. All I'm here to, I, what I have to do responsibly from my end is tell you what it says and how it works. And from there, um, you do you, as the young people say. Let's jump in, folks. Let's jump in. So the main thing I want to drive home tonight is that when we tell the story of the Zohar, it's something like sometimes we tell the story of philosophy, that there was a bunch of Greek people and then a bunch of medieval people, and then Descartes happened and nothing happened in between. It's as if there were a bunch of Greek people and there were a bunch of medieval people and then Descartes happened. And it's as if nothing happened in, in the middle of all that. Sometimes we do, the, we do the same mistake when it comes to the Zohar or the Kabbalah. We, we pretend that the Zohar got written and then Isaac Luria came and then everything was done. And, it, and that Kabbalah has not changed since then and that Kabbalah was not there before that, right? And not, that story is just incorrect. What's really important to know is that the, uh, the, the appearance of the Zohar beginning in the 1790s and then through the early 14th century, it didn't make huge waves. It wasn't a big deal. Many people did not buy into it. It wasn't widely disseminated, and many people didn't know about it. It slowly, slowly, slowly began to percolate through Europe, and then eventually to Italy, and eventually to the East, and the Morocco, of course, as well. What's important to know is that it just didn't make a big, it wasn't a big splash at first. It was mostly the purview of a very tiny group of people who did not make it public. And can you blame them? We just talked about all kinds of weird stuff the Zohar teaches. Do you want to be the guy that gets the first couple pages of Zohar and goes to your local rabbi and tells him that you believe this? No, you're going to sound like a crazy person. The Zohar sounds crazy now. Do you really want to be the person to go and be like, yeah, preach it from the mountaintop. Let's talk about Zohar in 1310 in a village in Germany. People are like, you mean that we have to get married to God? What are you talking about? They're going to think you're a crazy heretic. And so what ends up happening is the Zohar is kind of parceled out in sections and sent all around. People are carrying chunks of it, but no one's really going to publicize it. People are still playing their cards pretty close to their chest. Because again, this is a pretty dangerous time to be Jewish. This is a pretty dangerous time to be a heretic. You do not want to become a heretic Jew. You don't. That's a death sentence in many ways. And so the Zohar and Kabbalah are still being played pretty close to the chest. Also around this time, it's not like the Zohar ended with a Zohar. Now that's a weird thing to say, but what ends up happening is that after the Zohar, as we have it, is kind of done, there are Zoharic-like documents that get produced after the Zohar, the most famous of which are, is a document called the Tikkunei Zohar. Another is the Ra'ayah Mahimna. And these two documents are actually probably produced in the same group of people that produced the Zohar, but they're not quite the same. But they're so associated with the Zohar that they're kind of Zohar-like, so much so that in a modern version of the Zohar, they're attached to the Zohar. They're kind of like an appendix, like an apocrypha. They're kind of like Zohar apocrypha. That's maybe not quite true, but they're, they're, they're put there and they're not quite the same as Zohar. Although I will say that in the night in the modern uh, Daniel Matt edition, that is to say the 12 volume massive Daniel Matt uh, edition that's out now, he does not translate Raya Mahimna. Although Tikkun Zohar and Raya Mahimna in many ways were more popular because they're more coherent than the actual Zohar itself was. These are kind of like digests of Zoharic material. So we also have a kind of the Zohar as a kind of half life. So we have the main Zohar and then we have the half life of the Zohar. And it sort of continues to exist in a strange way for a couple decades after it's actually completed or completed as much as it was. We don't even know how it was disseminated. disseminated. Um, there's a great book by Boaz Hus that I have back here about it's a study of just what we know about how the Zohar actually got published and how it got uh, disseminated out. And what we now think is that it was never disseminated out in one complete text. It was always parceled out into chunks and those chunks kind of moved around. And one of the things the early printers had to do with the Zohar was collect all those chunks and then organize them into one text and then print that. So it was a mess. It was also just a mess of a text, even in terms of its, uh, its, its, uh, its, its uh, uh, dis dissemination. 
Um, one of the texts that we do know of, however, that was incredibly um, um, popular was a, a very small section of the Zohar called the Sifra de Tzniuta, which is without a doubt the most complicated and bizarre section. It's only about 10 pages of the Zohar if you read it in Aramaic, but it's the most enigmatic section of the entire text. For whatever reason, this was really, really important to people, and that's a text that really traveled far and wide. It's an incredibly difficult to understand section. Uh, I've probably read it a dozen times that I can tell you that uh, even trying to summarize it right now, I would be at, it'd be fits and starts. It's so weird. So we do know that some sections of the Zohar proved very popular early on and some sections didn't. So it wasn't even like it was received clearly in one kind of way. What we think happened was that the Zohar was kind of sent out in digests and people in various communities found certain parts interesting and certain parts not. And it was kind of spread out like this. In the generation after the publication of the Zohar, we basically have three major things that begin to happen. The first major thing that begins to happen in the uh, aftermath of the publication of the Zohar, which no one, everyone knew was important. Everyone realized this is an important document. It's substantial, right? I mean, think about the documents we've talked about so far in this class. They're 30, 40 pages long. This is 1,700 pages. This is a monumental text a monumental text. So regardless of what you thought about it, it was important. It wasn't just a 200 page, 100 page safer by here. This was a monumental piece of literature. So there were three basic reactions to it that followed in the aftermath of it. The first of it was, what does this text even mean? Remember, this text isn't even written in standard Hebrew. It's written in an obscure dialect of Aramaic, so obscure, that you basically have to learn the dialect of Aramaic just to read it. It's not even in a standard Babylonian Aramaic. It's in an idiolect of, of Palestinian Aramaic. It's a very, very strange language. So just to try to figure out what it meant took about a generation. Secondly, many people did not buy it. They didn't believe it was real. They thought it was a forgery. There were many, many Jews that thought this document's a forgery and it's dangerous. It's full of heretical nonsense ideas, and it's going to get people to become pagans. And so we have, for instance, the very famous story of uh, Itzach of Akko, and he saw parts of the Zohar actually in Palestine. It had reached him uh, in Palestine, and he read it and thought, this is really weird. And if it's by Shimon Bar Yochai, I want to understand it for sure. So what did he do? He went all the way to Spain to try to find out where this thing came from. He did the detective work. He traced it. He went all the way back to Spain. He made it to Guadalajara. He made it to Leon. And he made it to Moshe de Leon's wife. And Moshe de Leon's wife ratted him out. She said he made it up from his own head. It came from his own intelligence. And he, Isaac, uh, Isaac of Akko said, do you mean to tell me he did not have any ancient manuscripts? And he, she was like, no. He made it up. Now, what does make it up mean? Well, it might mean he was a fraud. It might also mean, according to other interpretations, is that he had a kind of mystical insight. And his mystical insight allowed him to kind of channel the Zohar, the same way that Joseph Smith channeled the Book of Mormon. That's a claim that people have made, right? The Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith never claimed he actually translated from gold plates. Joseph Smith claimed he used stones and looked into a hat and translated it spiritually. Well, maybe did something, uh, Moses of Leon did something similar with the Zohar. So there were people actively trying to do investigative work to figure out whether this thing was real, right? Now, what's weird about Isaac of Akko is that eventually toward the end of his life, he accepted the Zohar as legitimate, despite what Moses of Leon's wife told him. He accepted it as legitimate. Now, legitimate. What does that mean? It's a big question. But he did ultimately come to accept it, but many people did not. The third thing is once you've understood what it's saying, once you can read the damn thing, well, how do you systematize it? What do these sephirot mean? How do you understand all these different connections? How do you understand the 10 sephirot tract of various matriarchs and patriarchs and are in these, real, these weird relationships and they have all these complicated things that they're doing? How do you systematize this thing into a way of being Jewish? You can't just let it be a bunch of weird stuff. If it's the case, as Zohar is telling you, 
that the entire purpose of this is the reparation of the world, the redemption of the world, the, the bringing forth of the messianic age, you got to figure out how to do it. And the only way to figure out how to do it is to systemize the text such as you can understand what's happening. If you need to balance out 10 things, you know what 10 things are and how the 10 things relate and how the meets vote relate to those 10 things. So you can do the work of mystically aligning them. So you're going to need people like encyclopedists. You're going to need people like systematizers. And that will be an entire generation, several generation of people that are going to be doing that work of systematizing things. And the first of one of the first of those great systematizers, right, is people like uh, is people like uh, Abraham uh, Gigatia. So uh, Abraham Gigatia um, is a person living in Spain. You can hear it in his name. Um, and he lived uh, roughly the same, right around the same time period, toward the end of the composition of the Zohar. And his work, the Sha'ar Ora, and there are some folks earlier than him as well that are worth uh, mentioning here. I'll mention some of those folks too. But Joseph Gugatia is probably either one of the earliest people to receive the Zohar as we have it now, and he may have likely been in the circle of people composing it. But his work, Sha'ar Ora, The Gates of Light, is the earliest attempt to formally systematize the structure of the Sefirot. So he's early on, right? So again, if you think about this, uh, the, the Sefer Zohar being written in the 1280s, 1290s, 1270s, you can see he's right in that time in Spain. So he receives a Zohar, and he's one of the earliest systematizers. And his book, Sha'ar Ora, is one of the earliest attempts to systematize it. And also, this is one of the earliest books ever translated out of Hebrew into Latin to give access of the Kabbalah to Christians. In fact, if you've ever seen this image, that is the front frontispiece for the translation by Rikius of, De La, of Joseph Kittia's Sha'ar Ora. You can see it translated here as Porte Lucis, the Gates of Light, Sha'ar Ora, right? So here we have it. And look, there we go. The earliest depiction of the Sfirot. And you can see it, Keter, Ochma, Bina, right? Yes, so Netzachod, right? So, right? So this is a very early depiction of, right? And this is supposed to be Shimon Bar Yochai, I think, right? Him uh, holding up the, the, uh, the Tree of Life. So this is an early, and I bet some folks have seen this picture before, and you have if you've been following these lectures. This is the Rhesius translation of the Sha'ari Aura. Skip through all my slides again to get back to where I was. Meets of us. Yeah, there we go. So Gukatiya is one of the earliest systematizers, and that's going to be really important because the, Kab the Zohar is very hard to understand, and systematize it's going to be very important in that process. Another really important early Kabbalistic document that's going to be, uh, that's going to be important here is going to be Menachem Rakanti's uh, uh, commentary on the Zohar. And Rakanti's commentary on the Zohar is going to be what's going to be part of legitimating the Zohar, because Rakanti is one of the great scholars of this time. And he's also going to do the part of sort of transmitting Zoharic ideas into Italy, right? So we have an Italian learning Kabbalah, then translating those, some, some of those ideas into into Italy, and this is going to be a, a big part of that. And once they get to Italy, they can spread everywhere because Italy obviously is the hub of the world, and so they can make it to anywhere in the world at that point once they reach Italy. Um, also, things are making their way over to Morocco. This is also very important. Morocco is going to be an incredibly important uh, spot for the de for the development of of Kabbalah, and we're all we're just in the infancy of figuring out how that worked, how things got to Morocco. There was a huge Jewish community in Fez. Um, and uh, there was until, until the 20th century, basically. And so Moroccan Kabbalah is going to be its own branch of Kabbalah. And it's one of the things I would love to see an entire book about is just the, the, uh, the movement of Kabbalah to Morocco and the, the development of Moroccan Kabbalah, which is a very many ways, like Yemeni Kabbalah is a distinct form of Kabbalah, but the studies on that stuff are just very primitive right now. They're very primitive. And you can imagine why. The, the, the archives are very difficult to access and you need to be able to read medieval manuscripts in four languages. It's tough. You got to be a, you basically have to be trained to do that job. And not many people are, not many people are. So this is a, a, one of the spots that future scholarship is going to make us a lot more wise about. <clears throat> also, by the way, it's also going to decentralize Europe in a lot of ways because so much of what's going to happen is going to be in Morocco, Yemen, 
uh, Iraq. Uh, we talk so much about Europe, but let me be very clear about this. European Kabbalah is just one part of the story. And the reason why we know that part of the story so well is because a lot of Europeans have done that work so far. Do not be fooled that Kabbalah is a European centric phenomena. Do not let that be fooled. We just don't know about the rest because we haven't done the work yet because we don't have people to do the work yet or we haven't prioritized it or both. What's also important to know about the development of Kabbalah and what, again, I call the interregnum, the period between the writing of the, comp the composition of the Zohar and the uh, rise of Lurianic Kabbalah is that there were other Kabbalahs around. It wasn't like the Zohar was going to win. The Zohar was one weird document that was out there and people were interested in it, but it wasn't like it was going to be the only thing. At the same time that the Zohar, the version of the, of the Kabbalah that's dominated by the Zohar, what we sometimes call Theosophical Kabbalah, there was another intellectual form of Kabbalah that developed. And this intellectual form of Kabbalah actually was much closer to philosophy. Remember that the, that the Zohar has a very kind of uh, don't like philosophy kind of bend, a little bit. There were other forms of Kabbalah that were developing. Remember, Kabbalah is developing in Spain and France and other places. And there's another form of Kabbalah that's much more cozy with philosophy. In fact, they want to combine Maimonidean philosophy, Neoplatonic philosophy, the Sefer Yetzirah. They want to combine all what's great about philosophy and all what's great about Kabbalah into one system. They don't want to kick. They don't want to kick Kabbalah. They want to kick philosophy to the road. They don't want to kick rationalism to the road. They want to actually blend them together. And so there are forms of Kabbalah that begin to develop, like I said, in Morocco and also in Spain that are much more cozy with rationalism, with the intellect, with, uh, with uh, Maimonides even. And these forms of intellectual Kabbalah are completely distinct from what's going on in the realm of the Zohar. Now, you don't hear a lot about these because they lost. The Zohar is going to win, right? Luria is going to win. But these other forms of Kabbalah are just as legitimate and just as worth studying. Now, what ends up happening in these forms of Kabbalah is that the spherot are there. Right? These forms of Kabbalah accept the Sefer Yetzirah. They accept the Iyun circle at some level. They said that the Sefirot are real. They're just not parts of God. They're parts of our intellect. They're the parts of God that actually are a part of our intellect that are the image of God inside of us. And so they're not metaphysical objects that are worthy of speculation out there. Right? The latter is not from me to up there. The latter is from in here to God. The ladder is in here. It's in the intellect. And you climb it in here, in your mind, in the intellect, not ontologically out there. It's all in here. You go in, not up. In this form of Kabbalah, the intellect is central. And what you do is that you, in, you go inside of your mind and through a process of meditation, through a process of breathing techniques, through a process of writing out words and meditating on language, you begin to clear the mind. And as you begin to clear the mind of the nonsense, you begin to uncover the reality of God. And then you begin to climb up the spherot in your mind by uncovering the structures of the mind, the pure mind. And that pure mind is an imprint on you from God. And by climbing up the ladder of the intellect, your intellect becomes united with God at some level. Notice this is a very different way of doing Kabbalah. It has everything to do with meditation. It has everything to do with, with, uh, with uh, contemplation as opposed to following Jewish law. It's a very, now, you can't not follow Jewish law, too. That's important, but this is a very different kind. The apex of this form of Kabbalah, we often call ecstatic Kabbalah. Ecstasis means to go out of yourself. We'll see what this means in just a second. Or we call it prophetic Kabbalah. And the, and the most important example of this is, of course, Abraham Abulafia, right? Abraham Abulafia, another Spaniard, right? Born in Spain. Again, this is a thing where any Ashkenazi person should be very thankful for all the kind Sephardim who have given us Kabbalah. Abraham Avalafi was born around 1240 and died around 1291, so born right around the time of the rise. He's contemporary with the rise of the Zohar, but from his writings, we can't tell that he knows anything about it. He existed right around the time it was being written, but there's no evidence he knew anything about it, basically. 
Um, he roamed around a whole lot. Abraham Avalafia roamed around just to look at his travel log would make anyone jealous these days for those of us locked down. We would love to be able to travel around like Avalafia. In fact, he traveled as far as Iraq and Iran, and he's trying to find a mystical river called the Sambation. Uh, there's an idea that there's a mystical river called the Sambation uh, beyond which the 10 lost tribes of Israel gathered. And if you can find the river and bring them across, then you can begin the process of uh, redeeming the world and bringing in the Messiah. Uh, very early on, Abilafia had um, messianic schemes, one might call them, but the world was cast into chaos. If you look at the time period, right, 1240 to 1290, we're looking at the high point of the Crusades. And so that wasn't a good time to be in that region. And so eventually he turns, he turns back. Uh, Abilafia, aside from the Bible in many ways, and the Talmud had one text that he felt was very dear to him. And that was Maimonides' Guide of the Perplexed. Now, most of us do not associate mysticism with Maimonides. Most of us do not associate mysticism with the God of the Perplexed. In fact, if you ask most people what is the most anti-mystical text in the history of Judaism, they're going to tell you it's the God of the Perplexed. Abilafi would tell you that you're wrong. Sorry. So around the age of 31, he returns to Spain after traveling around a long time, and he begins to have these uh, what he would call prophetic or ecstatic experiences. And this was brought on by uh, some degree of mixing magical techniques that he probably uh, adopted from the world of the Ashkenazic pietists, the uh, Chaste Ashkenaz, and also some techniques that he's being developing from the Sefer Yetzirah. And what ends up what he ends up developing is a very complex system of breathing techniques, of letter combination techniques, of meditation techniques, and even body uh, body techniques. And many of these we think are being picked up from Sufism. Again, we're talking about him traveling in the Islamic world, and he's probably picking up some Sufi techniques. If you've ever seen the whirling dervishes and people like them who enter into trances by uh, body breathing and spinning techniques, it's, it seems very likely that Abilafi is picking up some of those kinds of techniques as well. And what ends up happening is Abilafi develops a prophetic form of Kabbalah. Now, this prophetic form of Kabbalah, of which we have a, about a half a dozen books that he's written, the, most, the earliest of which is a text called Sefer HaYashar, the Book of the Upright. And these mystical um, insights that he gets, we'll talk more about how he achieves them in just a minute, but these mystical insights that he gets eventually convince him that he is, uh, well, he's the Messiah, <laughs> um, which is always, as you probably know from Jewish history, the most dangerous thing you can, most dangerous thing you can believe you can be. Uh, if you want to get yourself killed, start believing you're the Messiah and you'll be dead in no time. So he believes he's uh, the Messiah, and of course what he does is he does what any rational person does, and he goes to Rome to tell the Pope that he's going to convert him to Judaism and begin the process of the redemption of the world. Well, the Pope basically orders him to be arrested and killed, and Abba Lafia's great luck is that the Pope dies. He has a stroke or something, and he dies. And Abba Lafia is, I think, briefly arrested by the Dominicans or some such, and he's, uh, he's released. I don't know how he got that lucky, but you know, and, and this happens, by the way, to several people in history. They challenge the Pope to this or that and whatever, and they get themselves killed, and the Pope dies. So, um, again, not to hope anyone dies, much less the Pope. But um, I'm glad that I'm glad that Abba, I'm glad that Abraham Abilafi did not uh, did not get to show down the Pope. Sorry, folks. Looks like my browser crashed. I have too many tabs up, I can guarantee you. The curse of the academic. We're not there anymore with Abilafia. Yeah. The Pope died and Abilafia lived. Good job, Abilafia. Um, he would spend the rest of his career basically traveling around, writing books, lecturing on the guide, the perplexed, and basically saying that he was the Messiah. And uh, eventually toward the end of his life, uh, some pretty important Jewish folk in the uh, area of Sicily ultimately had him condemned uh, by another Kabbalist, right? Uh, Shlomo ben Edret. It was a pretty famous Kabbalist at the time. He was at least friendly with Kabbalah. And he had him basically exiled, and he disappears from history in about 1291. So uh, what ends up happening is Abilafia vanishes. We don't know what happened to him. Uh, he died or disappeared or become occulted. He'll come back later and save us all. I don't know. Um, Abilafia produced 
enormous amounts of works, prophetic works, commentaries on the Moses's, uh, Moses Maimonides' God of Perplexed and the Sefer Yetzirah. And his combined works now comprise about 13 modern volumes. I have the complete works of uh, Abba Lafia downstairs in Hebrew, and there's about 13 volumes, although they're not terribly reliable. The, the uh, a critical edition of Maimonides' works is still something we, we need. It's still not there yet. And so Maimonides is one of these critically important mystics that we just don't have a complete works for in Hebrew, even in English, really, which is a disaster in, I think, a lot of ways. But maybe one day in our lifetime, we'll, we'll have it. What makes Maimonides or what makes uh, Abalafia's work so important is that not only does he do philosophical speculation, he tells you how to do these techniques. He tells you the breathing techniques. He tells you the letter techniques. He tells you how to do the combinations. He tells you. They are guidebooks. And those parts of the books rarely ever got printed because people were terrified of trying this stuff because Abalafio did this stuff and thought he was the Messiah. And people did not want that happening. And so these sections of these books are hardly ever even reproduced in Hebrew. I do have them in Hebrew and they're super complicated. It's all about com combining letter vowels and things, uh, letter values and stuff like that. Although I will say that recently a, uh, there was a, a scholar named Moshe Adel, the most important, one of the most important scholars of Kabbalah these days, Moshe Adel, did work with a New York scientist to reproduce some of uh, Abraham Abalafia's breathing and uh, meditation techniques. And it showed um, on the neurological level, it showed results. It was changing people's brains, right? So there is something to it in the same way we've studied uh, Zen monks' brains and nuns who chant, so there is something to it. How did this work? Um, what he thought, right, and this is to get a little bit into the weeds of medieval philosophy, which I'm not going to do because I don't want to make you a crazy person, but um, there was an idea coming from Aristotle that, that your intellect, right, so think about a bunch of, of, of dominoes. Imagine the universe is a bunch of dominoes. No domino can fall on its own. Some domino needs to knock the other dominoes down. And each domino has to be knocked over by another domino. So every, every domino is passive until another domino acts on it and knocks it down. And then that domino knocks it, and it becomes the new active domino. And it knocks the other passive domino down. Active, passive, active, passive, active, passive, active, passive. Aristotle thought that the, unit, the mind were like that too. Your mind is passive at first, and it needs something to activate it. But it can't activate itself. So what activates it? another mind outside of it. It's like a domino clicking your mind on or someone turning a light switch on. The light is passively on or passively there. And then we click the light and we are the active lighter upper. And then the light shines. Well, Aristotle thought that there must be something outside the mind that lights the mind up. Your mind is passive and something activates it. What's that active thing that lights the mind up? Another mind. What mind? God's mind. God's mind turns the light on in your mind. It illuminates your mind. Well, often our minds are kind of full of gunk, right? I mean, think about your day. Do you really think about how your mind is a realm of God? No, you think about paying the bills and getting the kids and doing the thing and getting some food and doing whatever, teaching a class. Your mind is covered over with all kinds of layers of things that make you forget what you are. You're a mind activated by God's mind. Well, what is, what is the technique that Abalafi develops? A way of clearing off the gunk so that your mind reaches all the way back up to the divine mind and that your mind and God's mind become connected again. And when that happens, when your mind and God's mind become connected, you see like God does. You see time just as one thing, right? You're now no longer in third dimensions. You're in four dimensions and you see time. You can look that way into the past and look that way into the future. That's prophecy. You can see how things are going to go. You can see how things went. You can see where you are. You see from a God's eye perspective. Your mind becomes connected to God's mind at some level. And Abalafia tried to develop meditation techniques and language techniques to reconnect your mind to God's mind. Now, notice how this is very different than the Zohar. The Zohar is a very different animal than this. You are trying to climb back up something, but in a very, very different way. In fact, even Abalafia gives us pheno phenomenological characteristics to let us know we're on the right path. He says, when you start doing this correctly, your body will emit light. 
you'll see a double of yourself in front of you. Like another you, your selim, your astral body communicating with you. And eventually you'll have a terrifying moment, but then you'll break through to pure joy, right? And once you break through to pure joy, you're then jettisoned up to the divine mind. By the way, this sounds a lot like Zen Buddhism in a lot of ways. And many people have drawn a lot of comparisons between Zen Buddhism and Abhilafya's meditation techniques. So this how-to aspect of Abhilafya's work was always viewed with a lot of suspicion by a lot of Jews because of how Abhilafya turned out. And also just because it's the idea of joining with God is a very controversial idea in Judaism because, you know, the, the idea is that God is transcendent and you're not. And so that's a, a, a weird thing in Judaism. But Abhilafya's ideas were incredibly interesting. And eventually his ideas will get redeemed back into mainstream Kabbalah. And I would say that now Abhilafya's ideas are being brought back in and synthesized at some level with ideas from the Zohar. But you can see they're very different ideas. And I bet you can see these are very different ways of doing Kabbalah. These are fundamentally different ways of doing Kabbalah. But what's important about this is just to know that what the Kabbalah was in 1300, 1350, was not sorted out yet. They were Kabbalahs. And because they were Kabbalahs, it could have gone lots of ways, but eventually it's going to go one way. And we'll talk about that way. We'll, we'll talk about the way in just a second. Or we'll start talking about it now, actually. The most important event in the history of the Kabbalah is the Alhambra Decree, which, as I'm sure all of you know, the Alhambra Decree was the uh, decree by the Spanish uh, monarchs, uh, Isabel and Ferdinand, who I have a coin of them over there in my collection, um, who uh, banned all Jews from living in Iberia uh, beginning in the summer of 1492. Uh, of course, the, I, the, the enactment of the Alhambra Decree took effect on Tishbaav of that year. So add injury to insult. And what ends up happening is that, like in many cases, as we talked about early on in this class, when something really bad happens to the Jews, the Jews don't get running, the Jews get apocalyptic. So when bad stuff happens, apocalypticism kind of comes in and say, hi, guys, I'm here for you. And so this apocalyptic fervor begins to emerge in Judaism again with the, when, with the Alhambra decree, and that apocalyptic fervor is combined with the Kabbalah. Now, if you can't imagine a more spicy thing than that i don't know what you can think of K kabbalah plus apocalypse is like that's the bee's knees y'all that's the thing and so they begin to combine these ideas not only that there's an idea that god had sent the kabbalah to prepare the jews for 1492 with the alhambra decree and that the Alhambra decree was the beginning of the end of the world, the whole damn thing, or the beginning of at least the Messianic era, and that Kabbalah was how to bring it home. So what was previously before 1492, a very carefully guarded secretive world of Kabbalah, after 1492, the new idea was we need to popularize this because by popularizing it, we will herald the Messiah. Kabbalah is the road Kabbalah is like the rug that we lay out for the Messiah. We got to roll the rug out. How we roll the rug out? By popularizing these ideas, by intensifying our devotion to this new idea, right? Which again, to them wasn't new, right? They really believed it was ancient. And to wit, because they believed that it was ancient, because they really believed that the Zohar really all came all the way from Shimon Bar Yochai, where did they go to settle when they were exiled? Many of them were collected by Baez II, who I also have a coin from. By the second was the Ottoman uh, Turk uh, emperor, who was incredibly gracious. He sent his entire fleet to rescue Jews who were being uh, exiled from Spain. Again, this is one of these things where we should tell the story very clearly that this is a case where Muslims saved Jews. By the second recognized this as a, a, a very important thing for his empire, and he brought Jews all the way to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, by the way, in 1492, there was no printing presses in the Ottoman Empire. In 1493, there was one in Salonika set up by Jews. So Baez II was very, very intelligent in this regard. He knew that, the, that rescuing the Jewish population would be good for his empire. And so many Jews who came from Spain after 1492, after the Alhambra Decree, where did they go? They were Kabbalists. They first went to Jerusalem. And then where did they go? 
they went home. Where is home? The Galilee, where Shimon Riocha is from, the author of the Zohar. Now think about how interesting this is. This is a document written by someone that's not actually from Palestine, a Spaniard, in that you have an entire population moving to Israel, Palestine, they land in Jerusalem, and they settle in the area of their hero, Shimon Bar Yochai, Meron and Sfat. And if you know anything about Meron and Sfat, you know that is now, to this day, the center of Kabbalah. They built a center where there was none prior. They built an entire world for themselves and then lived in it. It's an amazing mystical story in many ways. In the world of the Ottoman Empire, the Kabbalah is about to undergo a titanic change, a titanic change. So some of the earliest important systematizers of Kabbalah at this time was uh, Meir Ibn Gabai. In fact, sorry, Meriam Gabai, he wrote one of the earliest systematic uh, accounts of, um, of Kabbalah as we have it. But the most important uh, systematizer of Kabbalah is going to be at this time, Moses uh, ben Yaakov Cordovero. And he's going to write, uh, published in 1548, his uh, Pardes Ruamim. And this is the most encyclopedic, most coherent, and most systematic account of Zoharic Kabbalah to be produced, basically in some ways, ever. And uh, just to briefly summarize how he thinks, what you know, some of the things he thinks, he imagines the spherot as emerging from a kind of dialectic. That is to say, they always contain their opposite, and their opposite breaks off for them. Have you folks ever seen how cells go undergo like mitosis, right? Is it mitosis where cells break away from each other? All right, where they sort of, there you see them like doing the thing and they, right? And they, right? He imagines that all the sphere wrote that Ain Sof contained a contradiction and that from that contradiction emerged a sphera and then that contained all the contradictions of Ain Sof and it broke again broke again and broke again and broke again. So what we have in, uh, in the ideas of Cordovero is we actually have a reason why the spherot developed the way they did. For him, there's an inner dynamism even inside each sphera. And that's going to get turned up to the max when we get to Itzakluria here next time. So he's again, he's trying to systematize why the Zohar works the way the Zohar works. Why does spherot obey rules? What are the rules the Sphero obey? How do they work? And why are they the way that they are? So he's, he's the great systematizer. Another major work that he has is a text called Or Yakar. Uh, Or Yakar is a commentary on all the Zohar literature. In fact, this commentary is so vast that a modern edition is still not done yet. There is no modern edition of the Or Yakar. They're still fixing it. <laughs> They're still putting it out in Hebrew. I think it's I think it's running the 24 volumes at this point. I mean, he spent decades working on it. Uh, I, it. It may be done in our lifetime. The modern edition may be done in Hebrew in our lifetime. Uh, English edition is not even on the radar. Just to get an just to get a standard Hebrew edition done, this work is so massive. It's I think been in the work since the 60s, and I think it's still not done. I think there are 24 volumes in it or something. It's a massive, massive, massive commentary. Another work that he produced was a, a document called the Tomer Devora, uh, the Palm Tree of Devora. This is an ethical, very tiny little book, very, very tiny little book. You could read it in an afternoon. Um, and this is an ethical version of Kabbalah. This is trying to understand Kabbalah as an ethical program, how to be a Kabbalistically informed Jew. And these ethical Kabbalistic books, these kind of books of, uh, of uh Kabbalistic Musar um, ethics, how to be a Kabbalist, how to be a Kabbalistically informed Jew. In fact, many of those are responsible for popularizing a lot of Kabbalistic ideas. In fact, I, sometimes some people ask me, what Kabbalistic book would you read first? And I tell them uh, from uh, the advice of a friend of mine um, that uh, I would say Tomer Devora. If you want to read any Kabbalistic book first, get a copy of Tomer Devora, because that's the easiest way of getting an inroad into this conversation. You can buy copies that are in Hebrew and English and things like that. So he also wrote this text, Toma Devora, a very important ethical work of Kabbalah. Cordovero was the great systematizer of his generation. And I would say that in many ways, 
I'll speak for myself personally here, which I rarely do, but I will say I prefer Cotovero's system of Kabbalah in many ways from a philosophic point of view more than I uh, appreciate Itzhak Luria's. Now, I know you're not supposed to say that because Itzhak Luria is the bee's knees of everything in the all time, but I will find, I will say that Cotovero's system I find to be much more rigorous, much more systematic, much more uh, philosophically thoughtful. So I appreciate Cotovero a great deal and think of him as a great genius. Now, his elder brother, elder brother-in-law, right, was Shlomo Alchabetz. Now, you may have never heard of Shlomo Alchabetz, but I bet you've sung a song he wrote, a little ditty called Lecha Dodi. If you've ever practiced Kabbalat Shabbat, the service on a Friday night to welcome in Shabbat, if you've ever sung Lecha Dodi, you've engaged in Kabbalah. Congratulations. The entire service of Kabbalat Shabbat was invented by the circle of people like Joseph Alchabetz, Right and people like uh, like Cordovero and uh, people like uh, Joseph Caro, they invented that entire service. That entire service was invented out of whole cloth by Kabbalists, and Lechadri is the high point of that service, and it's a Kabbalistic hymn to the Shabbat to the Shabbat as Shechina. So also he uh, developed uh, some of the all night study sessions that became important important to the development of the holiday of Shavuot. If you've ever done a tikkun on Shavuot, we stayed up all night. Uh, those kinds of ideas are also to be found in uh, in ideas of people like Shlomo Alkabetz and other folks. In fact, uh, Alkabetz and Joseph Caro, who I'll talk about in just a second, they moved to Palestine because a spirit, an entity, a magid, a preacher, the Shekhinah, told them they have to relocate to Palestine and go to uh, Tzvat. Uh, Joseph Caro, who you probably know more famously as the author of the Shulchan Aruch, the definitive document of Jewish law. Definitive. There is no more important document in Jewish legal history than the Shulchan Aruch. It was produced by Joseph Caro, a Kabbalist of this time period, who saw visions. Of the of the of the Magid, sometimes as the Shekhinah, sometimes as a embodied version or a spiritual version of the of the Mishnah, uh, you know the, the the rabbinic text. And so, so much of modern Judaism, whether it's the legal text like Shulchan Aruch or whether it's ritual tech ritual stuff like uh, Kabbalat Shabbat, or it's musical stuff like Lecha Dodi, or it's other things, all of this is being formed and fused and hewn and developed in the 16th century in the aftermath of the uh, of the 1492 disaster of the Alhambra decree and it's being developed by Kabbalists to popularize ideas from the Sefer Zohar to basically roll out a red carpet for the coming of the Messiah they are popularizing these ideas as part of a, a messianic redemption arc in their mind. So these ideas, which were very closely hidden, are now being published, put out there, rendered out there, song, make, make songs out of it. If you've ever been to a Friday night service at any synagogue ever, you are living in the shadow of these people doing Kabbalah in the hopes of using ideas from the Zohar to welcome and herald the Messiah. Now, I don't know if you know that you were doing that or care, but you were. So Kabbalat Shabbat, Friday night services begin here in Svat, right? At some level begin here at Svat and they are imbued deeply. Go read Lech Haredi. Go read the English translation for it. It's all about welcoming the bride, getting married to Shabbat in the form of the Shekhinah, et cetera. It's Kabbalistic all day long, all day long. The Zohar itself is also now reaching its it's, it's canonization at some level. It's printed for the first time in Italy at the printing of Cremona, although that printing is not very widely recognized. It's only ran for a few, a few, only ran for a few volumes, but the definitive edition was also printed just around the same time at Mantua and the Mantua edition became the standard version. The three volume version of Mantua became the standard edition. So the Zohar is now being printed. The printing of the Zohar actually was precipitated at least first by Christians. And then the Mantua edition is going to rapidly dissimulate the ideas of Kabbalah all through the world 
especially the European world. Cordovero's work is going to be soon surpassed by Isaac Luria. We'll get to him next time. What ends up happening is Cordovero dies, as we all will. And Luria comes to Tzfat the very day Cordovero died, the Ramak died. And above the funeral train of Cordovero, of the Ramak, Itzhak Luria saw a pillar of fire reaching up into heaven. Now, if you know something about the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus describes God as appearing to the Israelites as a pillar of fire. Literally, Isaac Luria says, Cordovero, God is literally going with Cordovero on his funeral train. And immediately Itzhak Luria joins the train. Itzhak Luria, the Arizal, the, the lion, uh, comes to Tzfat and spends only a few years in Tzfat before he dies. He only spends, but the few years that he spends in Tzfat before he dies, and he dies very young. I think he only, I think he's only like 40 or something when he dies. He spends a few years teaching and the three or four years that he spent in Tzfat or the two or three years he spent in Tzfat are going to transform Kabbalah forever. The teachings that he imparts to two of his students one is Chaim Vital, the other is another student called Israel Sarug, who's not as well known. But between Sarug and Chaim Vital, and really more Chaim Vital, Kabbalah is going to become a completely integrated part of Jewish theology, philosophy, and Jewish law. Kabbalah, as we know it, is going to basically become Lurianic Kabbalah. The, the Kabbalah, as we all know it, is going to be the Kabbalah downstream of Itzhak Luria and Chaim Vital. And what ends up emerging is that Chaim Vital's version of the Kabbalah, his very peculiar interpretation, which we'll get to, which we'll get to next time, becomes the authentic, definitive, final version of Kabbalah. That's a huge deal. He will set the stage for all further Kabbalistic speculation. Now, what's also important here is that the Christians have taken notice also of Kabbalah. They've also gotten interested in this messianic fervor, and they've also gotten interested in the idea that Jews may have had some weird secrets from way back in the day. Jews at this point, beginning in the 15th century, and especially by the 16th century, are taking intense interest in Kabbalah, and they're going to actually adopt Kabbalah to Christianity. And Christian Kabbalah is going to be an incredibly important part of the development of what we now call Western esotericism or the occult. So if you've ever studied magic, things like that, these ideas are going to be incredibly important when we get to Christian esotericism and the rise of occultism, right, in Europe. We'll get to that next time as well. It's going to be Vital, Chaim Vital, one of, uh, it's, uh, one of its like Luria's students who is going to provide the definitive version of Kabbalah as we know it. If you've ever studied Kabbalah, if you've heard phrases like simsum, contraction, tikkun olam, the reparation of the world, um, shira, right, the idea of the shattering of the vessels, klipot, the idea that, the, that, the, that the, there are broken vessels, there are shards of these vessels. Uh, if you've ever heard any of these ideas, these ideas come from Lurianic Kabbalah. They are versions of Kabbalah developed by Luria based on the Sefer Zohar. What we're going to do next week is we're going to dive into Lurianic Kabbalah. Lurianic Kabbalah, as I said just a moment ago, is Kabbalah. It's become the baptized version, if you like. It's the definitive, the authentic, the standard version. There were other versions of Kabbalah that existed prior, but Lurianic Kabbalah will become the canonical version of Kabbalah. So notice what's already happened. By the late 16th century, the Zohar is already accepted as canon. There's no doubt anymore, basically, about it. The question is, how do we interpret it correctly? Luria is going to become the canonical version of Kabbalah. That's a big deal. Because something that is, at this point, from 1572, Kabbalah is only about 300 years old. 1270s is when it first began to emerge, really. And by 1572, with the death of Isaac Luria, it's going to become definitive. So by 300 years, the Zohar is scripture. And it's going to affect every version of Jewish life, from the Siddur 
prayer book, to the liturgy, Kabbalat Shabbat, to ritual life, putting on tefillin during Chomoed, even Jewish law. It's going to affect all these things. And the Lurianic Kabbalah will be the standard mechanism by which all other forms of Kabbalah will be measured in the future. So we'll come back next week and we'll, hand, we'll begin the process of handling the Lurianic Kabbalah. Welcome back and thank you for joining me as I explore the garden that is Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah. Again, if you'd like to support my work of providing accessible, free, and scholarly content on topics like Kabbalah, alchemy, and the occult, along with magic and hermetic philosophy, consider supporting my work on Patreon or perhaps with a one-time donation. You can find those links below. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.